So one of the things I wanted to do um, is talk a little bit about our dreams program at NetSureIt. And, and one of the things I'd like to do is give it some context. <clears throat> it's very easy to see these things and kind of look at them and say, okay, yeah, I think I understand this. But without the right context, without the right understanding of where all this com comes from and, and some of the background on it, it's, it's difficult to put it into perspective. So, so there's sort of three things I wanted to share with you um, ab about dreams and about the dreams program today. The, the first one is that, and, I, and this may be a controversial statement, but I'll explain myself in just a minute. Um, if you really think about it, and you think about it long and hard, one of the things you'll find is that dreams are, are the reason we exist um, as a people, as a species. Um, now, I know that may sound a little bit, uh, a little bit like hyperbole, um, but, but I don't mean it in some sort of metaphorical way. I don't mean it in some sort of touchy-feely sort of new age kind of way. I mean it very, very literally. And, and let me give you some background on that. So one of the things I've always been really interested in uh, is history. And part of the reason for that is that my mother was a, was a history teacher. So I was raised to, uh, to A, learn history, whether I, whether I wanted to or not. Um, but, but my mother always impressed upon me the importance of history. You know, she always used to say the old, the old quote that, you know, those who, who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. So I spent a lot of my childhood uh, learning about history. But as I got older and as I got to, to be an adult, uh, one of the things that really fascinated me was, was the history that was never written down the history that we don't know about. And if you think about our species, you know, we've been around for a couple hundred thousand years, but we've only had written language for maybe five or 6,000 of those years, best case scenario. And so, so one, one of the things that fascinates me is, is what happened before we learned how to write things down. And we find more and more out uh, every single day, right? Archaeologists and, and people that study sort of this, this prehistory uh, they've come up with some pretty amazing things. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating is that I, I read a book uh, by a guy named uh, uh, Yuval Noah Harari. And it's a book called Sapiens, a really fascinating book. Um, and, and one of the interesting things that he comes up with there is this notion, he kind of compares us to some of the other species that evolved around the same time that Homo sapiens uh, evolved. It's really, the book is really a, a history of our species. And, and one of the interesting uh, groups of, of hominids that, that evolved back then were the Neanderthals. And they showed up, I don't know, 100, 200,000 years before we did. And, you know, we know this because <clears throat> we dug up their bones. We've, we found a lot of fossils and a lot of evidence that they were there. Um, and we've been able to look at that. And so, so for the longest time, uh, people dug up these bones and they, and they realized, wow, these Neanderthals, they were bigger than us. They were stronger than us. They were faster than us. But yet everywhere our species went, uh, and again, we, we were 100,000, 200,000 years late to the party here. They, they had already settled a good, good chunk of the world. Everywhere we showed up, we just absolutely annihilated them. We outcompeted them as Homo sapiens uh, in, in virtually every way. And so for the longest time, people said, well, yeah, that, that was because we were smarter uh, than they were. And when you think about it, you know, we use the term Neanderthal today as, as a bit of a pejorative term. If you say, oh, that person's a real Neanderthal, you know, what you're really saying is they're slow, they're dim-witted, uh, <laughs> they're not very intelligent. But then we started digging up their skulls. And one of the things that we found was that their cranial volume was almost exactly the same size as ours. They had the, they had brains that were just as big as modern uh, human brains, and so then that led to a real conundrum. People sat around and they said, "Well, so they were bigger, they were stronger, they were faster, they had similarly sized brains, and they were very 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 well adapted to their environment because they showed up on the scene a long time, thousands of generations before we did." And so, so that was a real conundrum. But, but one of the interesting things uh, in the Sapiens book and in, in another research uh, that they've kind of concluded, uh, and a lot of scientists support this today, is that we made a cognitive leap as a species about 70,000 years ago. And that cognitive leap was the ability to dream. And I don't mean like dreaming at night when you're asleep. <clears throat> what I mean is the ability to envision a future 
and a world that did not yet exist. The ability to dream things up that just weren't there yet. <clears throat> and it turns out the Neanderthals and all the other hominid species, they didn't have this ability. And that one cognitive leap, um, it literally changed the face of history and the, and the face of the planet. So, so, and, and that's what enabled us to compete. We were able to dream up things they couldn't dream up. We were able to dream up very, very complex things they couldn't dream up. And so when I say that, that dreams are literally the reason we exist, that's why. We had this amazing cognitive leap about 70,000 years ago that gave us the ability to dream when the other species didn't. And that has made all the difference uh, in the world. So that's the first piece of context, right? The second piece of context is that when you think about it, dreams are what make us uniquely human, right? Not only did we, did we evolve this ability, this cognitive leap that allowed us to envision a world and a future that did not yet exist, it enabled us to envision a, a, a future version of ourselves that did not yet exist, a better version of ourselves. And when you think about it, that's what really makes us human is that ability to not only envision a future world that doesn't exist, but enable, but to dream about a future version of ourselves that doesn't yet exist. Um, and that's a pretty amazing capability, and no other species can do that, right? I mean, it's not like my dog sits around thinking about, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I be a better dog today? Um, it's not like dolphins in the ocean swim around thinking, thinking all day long, well, how do I become a better dolphin, right? It would never occur to them uh, to think like that. It, it, they literally, they would, they would never think something like that, right? They live out their lives and they're, I, guess, I suppose they're happy, but that's not something that goes through the heads of even the smartest uh, animals that we know. So that's one of the things that makes us uniquely human. It's not opposable thumbs. It's not, not our, our intelligence per se. It's that ability to dream and, and that ability to, to dream of a better future for ourselves. Now, the challenge you run into, though, with dreams, uh, particularly about yourself, is that they require action. Um, they require you to do something because dreams without action are just, they're just fantasies uh, when, when you really think about it, right? Um, and so, so that's why our motto at NetSure is so important. Um, and when you really think about it, it's, it's supporting the dreams of the doers. And that's a, that's a, that doers part is really really important because you actually have to you have to go through some work you have to do some things to make yourself better. So the, our dreams program is all about how do you how do you make yourself better, but how do you take the actions that are necessary to become a better person, a better version of yourself, right? And it really reminds me of of uh, an author that I love, uh, Richard Bach. And Richard Bach is like the great, 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 great something grandson of, uh, of the famous composer Johann Sebastian Bach. And he wrote in one of, the, one of his books something, something to the effect of, um, for every dream you're given, you're also given the power to fulfill that dream. But it may take some work. And I think that's really important, right? That the ability to go out there and not just dream of a better version of ourselves, the dreams program is all about how do we enable people to do that? How do we enable people to take concrete action uh, to, to better themselves? Now, the third piece of context is also interesting. And, and this is my, my greatest wish for everyone out there is that we dream with the perspective and the confidence of a child. You know, I have a seven-year-old son and, um, and a lot of times, you know, the seven-year-old boys ask a lot of questions, right? And they come up with a lot of crazy ideas. You know, he'll come to me and say, Dad, what if we did this? What if we took this thing and this thing and, and lit it on fire? And, um, and you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to tell them things are impossible. But at some point you have to say, son, that's just not possible. That, that's really not going to work uh, the, the way you think it's going to work. But I've got to, and, and sometimes he's crushed when I say that sometimes, you know, he's so disappointed, but sometimes he persists and he proves me wrong. Um, every once in a while, I'll say, nah, you know, I don't think that's possible. And then he'll go do it. Now, the downside to that, I mean, I'm really proud of him, but the downside of that is that he, he, he won't let me live that down, right? He, he, he brings it up every day for weeks. I told, I told you so, dad, you said it was impossible. But it was, in fact, possible. So, so it's a lot of fun to do that. And it's really, really interesting, really annoying when he, uh, he just keeps bringing it up over and over again. But, but he's got that confidence, right? No one's told him these things are impossible. Some of these ideas he comes up with, 
He doesn't know that they won't work. He doesn't know that they're impossible. And that gives him such a huge advantage over most of us as adults because we we will write things off just out of, out of no, there's no way that could work. There's no way I could achieve that dream. So, so my greatest wish for us all is that that we dream with the, the perspective and the confidence of children. And it reminds me of, a, of an old story. I don't remember where I heard this story, um, but it was about a little girl about my son's age. I think she was in first grade. And, um, you know, she, she was in art class one day. And it was a nice art class. They had all these easels set up in the room where they could draw or paint or whatever. And normally the art teacher would would uh, give them an assignment, you know, draw a picture of a giraffe or <clears throat> whatever it was for, for the day. But on that day, she said, look, kids, just draw whatever you want. Draw a picture of anything you'd like. And so this little girl, she sat in the back of the room and normally she really didn't do much. She just wasn't into art. She would doodle and she just wasn't terribly interested into it. But on that day, the teacher looked back into the back of the room and saw her just scribbling furiously. She was working on something uh, like she'd never seen her before. So, so the teacher kind of kind of worked her way to the, to the back of the room and she asked the little girl, you know, uh, well, what are you drawing today? And the little girl said, I'm, I'm drawing a picture of God. And so, you know, the teacher thought about it for, for a minute or two. And she said, you know, sweetie, um, no, nobody knows exactly what God looks like. Um, and, and without missing a pencil stroke, the little girl says, well, they will in a minute. Um, and so, so that's the kind of confidence that we have to have as we dream. Um, when, when we look at ourselves and we look at creating a new version of ourselves and a better version of ourselves and reinventing ourselves, my greatest wish is that we can dream both with the perspective of a child, that perspective that hey, I'm not going to assume this is impossible. I'm going to give it a shot. And also with the confidence of a child. Um, that's my greatest wish for us all. So that's a little bit about the, uh, the DREAMS program. Hopefully that helps provide uh, a little bit of context for you.